So we started with two questions in this lecture. The first was uh, where to map uh, from x to y and uh, what sort of map. Uh, we have answered the first question is that we are going to map onto the independent standard normal space. So that's what you see uh, on the top part of your screen is that we have the basic variable space uh, on the uh, left um, and there's the limit state uh, there are the PDF contours and then uh, for some map T uh, we uh, get into the independent standard normal space there is a new limit state equation uh, and new PDF contours which happen to be the contours of the uh, independent standard normal concentric circles around the origin. So um, the second question now is what sort of map? Uh, turns out there are several possibilities uh, and um, uh, they are widely used. Uh, so let's, let's look at uh, about five of them. The simplest one is a linear map from x to u. So this is called the second moment transform because the, the first and the second moments, the mean and st uh, standard deviation are being used. Uh, it's also called hassefer lind transform because uh, those are the two authors who proposed this first. And what you see on the second line in that box is the transformation uh, from uh, x to u. So uh, in effect what we do is uh, we subtract the mean of x and divide it by the standard deviation of x and we get the u. So we do it for every x and as you see uh, this map uses or needs uh, no other information uh, which means uh, is that uh, if the x's were dependent uh, there is no way of imposing or accounting for that dependence. Uh, the x's can be very non-normal uh, but uh, this linear transformation has no way of capturing that. Uh, clearly I am sure you, you recognize uh, this transformation that we have used many times when we uh, try to find the normal probability. So uh, any arbitrary uh, normal random variable x, uh, if we convert it to the standard normal, this is exactly what we do and that helps us compute the CDF of x. Uh, so here this map would be exact uh, if uh, x was a normal random variable and all the x's were independent. Uh, so exact in the sense of preserving the uh, probability information and preserving the nature uh, of the limit state. Uh, but uh, this is a very simple transformation, very popular and in many cases quite adequate. So uh, we are going to use this in the examples that we will take up uh, in the next lecture. The next map uh, is the, the full distribution transform. Uh, and uh, this acknowledges the fact that the x's could be non-normal in nature. So uh, what is lost in the hassefer lin transformation uh, is preserved here. So here uh, it's point by point full distribution transformation. So every x is related to the corresponding u through uh, an equivalence in the CDF. So u is phi inverse of f of x for each i or the reverse map would be uh, x would be f inverse of phi of u. So uh, this works great, uh, preserves uh, the complete uh, probabilistic information uh, but uh, if the x's had any dependence uh, this member by member transformation obviously cannot capture that dependence. So uh, this works great 
uh, when uh, the uh, when the axes are independent. Obviously, what we would need we would need uh, to know the functional form of capital F, and we should be able to invert it uh, inexpensively. As long as we can do that, this method should work great. Uh, it does impose an additional cost because uh, the limit state H in the new space U might get a little more complicated looking because of all this nonlinear transformation uh, involving phi and F. The next one uh, is Neta of transformation and this actually acknowledges the fact that there could be dependence in the uh, excess and in a rudimentary manner uh, this uh, attempts to address that point. So what we do here is the, there is an intermediate step. So from x we go to y and from then y we go to u. So um, to go from x to y it's basically the full distribution transformation. Um, so y is phi inverse of f of x. That's fine but then uh, we do something clever uh, uh, for going from y to u and there we create a linear combination. So uh, the u's are a linear combination of the y's or conversely the y's are a linear combination of the u's. And what is the nature of that linear combination? Uh, what we do is uh, we uh, create the Cholesky factor of the correlation matrix of, of the y's and impose that so that uh, that dependence on uh, the y's are realized. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, if you invert uh, the equation in that second line of the Nataf transform box which is u equals a inverse y, it's basically y is a of u. So y is a linear combination of the u's u themselves are independent standard normal but because of the presence of the A matrix uh, the y's become dependent because uh, they are combining the same u's so the y uh, vector has a correlation matrix rho y and now if I uh, transform y's point by point to x or x to y then the x's naturally have a dependence imposed upon them. Uh, there is one subtle point there is that the uh, dependence imposed upon the excess uh, would be different from that uh, uh, between the y's uh, in terms of the correlation matrix because all we are doing here is imposing the uh, correlation structure. Uh, but for most cases uh, this uh, difference between uh, the row of y that we start with and the row of x that we get is not much. Uh, if you want to be very um, strict about this then uh, there could be an iterative process in which we find out uh, what uh, changes in row y would give me the exact desired row x that we know. So uh, that way we would uh, be more uh, true to the correlation structure of the axis. Now obviously uh, this sort of dependence among the axis uh, is incomplete because correlation coefficient uh, only gives me a linear dependence information uh, but that is not a big problem uh, from a practical point of view because uh, in most cases uh, we do not have information uh, beyond the linear sort. So uh, all we have uh, would be the CDFs, the marginal CDFs of the axis and the correlation or covariance matrix and then uh, this data transformation uh, would be very very appropriate for uh, mapping from X to U. If we insert an additional step in the Nataf transformation uh, there is a way of capturing the tail equivalence, the tail of interest uh, between the x space and the u space uh, and that is known as uh, the rockwitz fiesler transform. Uh, so let's, let's look at the steps. So uh, we 
start with x, uh, then we get a y, then from y we get a z or a z, and then finally the u. So how are the y's obtained? The y's are the new uh, intermediate variable uh, which uh, tries to create equivalent normal mean and equivalent normal standard deviation for each of the x's. So you see the equations there and um, so you can see point by point we are fitting that. Uh, so for each value of uh, x there is a particular equivalent sigma and a particular equivalent mu and that would give me the the y and then we can standardize that. So the new standardized uh, y we are calling z so that is y minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So from uh, x we go to the equivalent normal y from there we get to the equivalent standard normal uh, z. Now so far we have not talked about dependence but now we are going to bring back uh, what we did uh, for uh, the Neta transformation uh, if we know what the correlation structure is then uh, we would uh, take the uh, factor A uh, for, uh, for the correlation matrix and then uh, we would linearly combine them uh, to get the U's or inversely we would uh, express the Z's in terms of a linear combination of U's and thereby uh, impose a dependence which can carry all the way to X's obviously because of the series of nonlinear transformations uh, rho of z is not going to be same as rho of x but we can adjust them to capture the true correlation structure. Now whether we are talking about rockwitz fiesler or Netaf it's not necessary that rho has to be there uh, we could very well uh, apply Netaf and rockwitz fiesler transformations uh, if the x's were independent. Uh, but they do give us an opportunity of imposing a partial uh, uh, measure of dependence uh, between them, between the x's. Uh, so just, uh, just to summarize, uh, this Rockwell-Fiesler transformation uh, can capture the tail equivalence better, although it in introduces a certain amount of uh, computational burden. Uh, an extra step in the process. The final map uh, that uh, we look at is uh, complete in every sense. Uh, it's the Rosenblatt transform. Uh, the problem is that we typically do not have information to this extent to uh, effect this sort of transformation. So if you see how this is uh, executed, uh, we do it step by step. So the very first equation transforms x1 to u1. Uh, no problem there. Uh, but then uh, we have to use the dependence. So we have to use the uh, conditional CDF of x2 given that x1 has taken that particular value. So clearly because of f of x2 given x1 uh, depends on what x1 uh, is. So uh, u1 and u2 naturally have a dependence uh, imposed on them. And then we proceed. So uh, x3 would be uh, so x3 given x1 and x2 uh, and then that would give me u3 and the transformation in each case is the full distribution type transformation that we have already seen. So um, phi of u is f of x except uh, the, the f of x is now conditional CTF except for the very first one x1 and we do it uh, all the way until we reach the last one which is f of uh, xn given all the previous values so if you know that uh, conditional CTF then we can invert that through the normal CTF and obtain the last member of the u vector. Uh, so this uses uh, the uh, full probabilistic information uh, including all dependent structure among the x's but it's more ideal in nature because um, it's practically very very difficult uh, to obtain uh, the, 
the joint CDF of order n uh, among the axes uh, in a uh, functional form.